Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome. I hope you're uh, enjoying this fabulous conference. Uh, I'm Naomi Freed. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Boston Children's Hospital, and I'm delighted to be the moderator of the panel that we're about to uh, talk with. You know, um, it's very common to hear about startup companies and early stage companies fostering innovation. And they have to because they're trying to bring new solutions and new services out to market. But they're not the only type of organization that's interested in innovation. In fact, big organizations, forward thinking big organizations are also very interested in fostering innovation. And during the next 50 minutes, we're going to dig into how large organizations can and do drive innovation. And I think you'll find it a very eye-opening uh, discussion. So I'd like to invite the panel out um, to uh, join us and um, give them a chance to uh, introduce themselves. And we're looking forward to having a conversation with you. I'll be asking them a couple questions to get going, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So. All right, so uh, Wendy, do you want to uh, introduce yourself, your organization, and the role you play, and then we'll just work our way down uh, the line? Sure. Uh, my name is Wendy Mayer, and I am the Vice President for Worldwide Innovation at Pfizer. And at Pfizer, our group is a corporate function working across the organization to try to drive innovation both internally and make connections to innovation happening outside of our organization. Hi, I'm Peter Margolis. I'm uh Director of Health Services Research at uh, Cincinnati Children's. Um, I wasn't sure about this, so I checked before I came. So Cincinnati Children's is the largest children's hospital in the world. Um, uh, we have uh, 580 beds, 13,000 employees. Um, I came to Cincinnati Children's after I was in practice because um, I was interested in redesigning care delivery systems. Um, and I saw how hard it was for doctors to face the systems that um, really don't allow us to do our best. Um, the thing that we're focused on is that um, the care that a patient gets is not just dependent on how good the doctor is or how much the uh, doctor cares. It depends on the system that the doctor works in. And our work in developing uh, in health services research is to try and redesign the way uh, care delivery happens so that it's much more effective by bringing patients and clinicians and researchers together. Hi, my name is Jennifer DeClellis, and I work for United Healthcare in the Medicare and Retirement business. I'm a director of innovation and business development there, and uh, I'm lucky because I'm really at the sweet spot of innovation, technology, healthcare, and insurance. And uh, I'm doing some very exciting work with AARP. Uh, I work with their innovation team to bring innovative new products and services to AARP members to really help them live healthier lives as they age. And I'm Paul Popolo. I head up the business innovation group at Highmark. And if you're not familiar with Highmark, Highmark is a uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, company up in Pittsburgh, but we also have West Virginia and Delaware. Uh, we also just recently acquired five hospitals, and we've affiliated with two others. So we're on our way to becoming an integrated delivery system. So it's an exciting time for innovation uh, up in Pittsburgh. And we also have the third largest vision company, which is a national company called VisionWorks, or Davis Vision, if, if you're more familiar with that brand. Uh, my team, our job is to develop new products, services, and business models um, that will lead to new growth opportunities for the company, uh, or differentiate us um, in the marketplace with our core business. Great. Well, uh, please join me in welcoming our very distinguished uh, panel. I think it's going to be a wonderful conversation. So let's start out with why innovate. Um, at Boston Children's Hospital, um, I am tasked with enhancing the culture of innovation, really focusing on um, clinical care. Um, we're trying to accelerate innovation so that we can deliver the best quality care and really be a top pediatric um, provider. I want to ask each of the panelists to talk about why their organization is interested in innovation and um, tell us more about what you do. 
Okay, I guess I'll start. Um, well, I, I think from, from the standpoint of a, of a large drug manufacturer, obviously innovation with regard to development of new drugs has always been a, a core to the success of our business and been something that we've been very focused on. I think what's newer for our organization is a focus on innovation beyond drug development. So how do we innovate our business model? How do we innovate our business partnerships? Um, and how do we really look to operate the company in a different way and what's really driving that uh, I think as you've heard throughout in a number of presentations yesterday and today is that the market is changing and so we've been very fortunate to have a business model that um, has enabled us to be a very successful organization but that's changing the the um, the government situation is changing the financing of healthcare is changing customer engagement is changing and what we found internally within our organization is that you can you can cut back and scale back on what you're doing and what we say very often internally is that you either you need to do more with less or you need to do less with less but either way you have less um, and and you can only do that so far and and what we've come to the realization around is that we really need to do things differently we need to find new ways that enable us to be as effective or more effective with less. And, um, and so there's a pretty big commitment internally to finding new ways in which we can do that. So a lot of emphasis on business model innovation and innovation yes. as a way to change the company. Yes, I mean, we're still obviously very focused on drug development innovation, and that's core to our business. Um, but I think we're, we've kind of opened the aperture on, on where we see the importance of innovation to our organization and made it much broader than it's traditionally been. Great. So tell us from a different perspective. Uh... Well, so at Cincinnati Children's, the business strategy is actually to uh, combine research, innovation, and application to produce the best outcomes possible for our patients. That's why people would fly from across the country to come to Cincinnati to get their care. Um, so our strategy is what we call playing the whole game. If we uh, if our goal is to get discoveries into widespread practice to improve patients' health, then we have to uh, move um, uh, move from basic science and discoveries in the lab to uh, uh, testing them in uh, research settings to wide-scale application um, to make sure that they're translated. The findings are translated into health. Um, what if GM engineers who were designing new cars just stopped when they published the designs of their cars? We would never get any new designs. And so um, our idea is that we're not, we're not interested in relying on a passive connection between the steps. Um, we want to, uh, we have a goal-directed model in which we are constantly measuring our outcomes and use the data about the outcomes that we're able to produce to identify gaps in care and gaps in outcomes and then feed that back into the system um, and engage the entire community of uh, researchers and clinicians in uh, thinking of ways uh, to overcome them. So Peter, you're, you're about sort of linking research with innovation and making sure there's a successful translation into actual operations. Right. That's great. So at United, um, it's absolutely necessary for us to have innovation to sustain and grow our business moving forward. As, as you've heard throughout this conference, um, our industry is just under tremendous pressure um, to, to make healthcare more affordable, to uh, increase access, to reduce uh, uh, costs throughout the system, et cetera. And um, as a result of that, we really need to think differently about the problems that we face, and we really can't do that without being innovative. So it's really a, a more of a mandate, I think, for us. And uh, we really, what we really want to get out of it is uh, the opportunity to, to serve our members for the long term. So really core business innovation and, and new products. Exactly. Terrific. Paul? And probably no different than, than my colleagues here on stage. We, we see, obviously, the markets changing, and we see the industries changing. Too many com competitors coming up these days in the health business. And when you look at all the regulation and the competition out there, we don't want to be uh, find our industry being reinvented out from underneath us. So unless we focus on new growth opportunities, unless we find um, new avenues for us to be in beyond just health insurance, um, that's a real concern. Uh, we believe, or at least in the innovation group that, that I manage, um, you know, care is going to be very different and consumers are going to drive care. Um, 
and those are some of the new models that we're looking at. So very similar to the other folks here is that we're looking at business model innovation, new business opportunities, new ways to look at uh, the financial models. Great. So, you know, traditionally people think of innovation as the purview um, of the startup world, but I think you're hopefully getting a sense that there's a lot that large organizations uh, can do and ways they can benefit from innovation, whether it's strategy, whether it's enhancing their business model, looking for new core products. So I want to ask each of the panelists, and we'll start down uh, with Paul, to talk a little bit about the value of the program that you bring to your organization. Maybe talk about a favorite success uh, that you've had, but just talk a little bit about how your organization benefits from having uh, an innovation focus? You know, I think with, we believe that we have to have an innovation group that kind of focuses on it 24-7. Um, the business itself is bogged down in the day-to-day -day operations, right? And that's what they should be doing. So it's very hard for them to kind of look at all the new things and work with all the new startups and talk to all the VC firms out there to try to find out what's new. So our value back to the organization is to kind of look at ideas, look at new opportunities and assess those and, and then either run the pilots ourselves or write the business cases and bring them and actually pitch them back uh, to our core leadership. So that's one of the things that we do and we manage that like a process. We manage a business process like anybody else does and we have a portfolio and we manage that portfolio against what's the core business ideas that we're working on, what are adjacent business models and what are emerging business models. Uh, and I spend a lot of time talking to the executives to explain to them what innovation is and what it isn't, right? Because everybody has a different view of what innovation is. So our value back to them is ultimately we run a process and they're gonna ask me, you know, at some point, what's the result of that process and what have you done for our organization? So we try to manage it just like any other business process, but our value back to them is to come up with the new ideas and to come up with new business opportunities for us to test. So can you share one of those new ideas or yeah. successful projects with um, us? Yeah, I think we've had a bunch of different things, right? Things that are we wouldn't consider innovative at all, right? The core business stuff. So whether it's mobile diabetes with a digital health coach that we tested and piloted and now we're trying to roll out to our ASO accounts, or whether it's a, a teledermatology solution that we launched uh, in collaboration with a local engineering firm in Pittsburgh where we're now in market as an adjacent opportunity. That's more of a partnership opportunity. And then we're launching... Um, two new businesses starting in February, uh, which kind of were generated internally from my group. Um, we have a lot of different projects along the way. Telemedicine lands in my shop, um, so that's a success for us. So you've heard some things yesterday about telemedicine. We already cover telemedicine and we're doing virtual primary care visits and teledermatology is another piece of that. Um, that's not necessarily innovative, but when the company doesn't have an owner for telemedicine, right, who's going to manage it, who's going to figure it out, who's going to figure out the new business models, how are you going to get that adopted by the internal business owners, that kind of falls into our, into our area. And can you just tell us how big your group is? How many people do you have working on this? We, uh, we have a small team. We're 14. Um, we try to stay low under the radar. I'm a big advocate of keeping innovation inside a company, not a skunk's work kind of group. Um, but I also don't want to be too big where you're, you know, catching everybody's attention because you're <laughs> such a big department. Uh, so we're small and nimble, uh, and we have people from inside the company that work with us, and we've hired a lot of people from outside the company to give us that different perspective. Terrific. Thank you. Jennifer? Sure. So I think the value that we deliver is really around um, building knowledge and being able to share that knowledge across different business segments. Um, you know, for a long time, I've worked in the innovation team at United for about five years now, and for a long time, um, we were really measured on what innovative new products and services ultimately came to market. And while that's very important and, um, you know, still a true metric uh, that we're accountable for, I think over time, what um, folks at United have come to realize is that there's an awful lot of value in the learning that we get of going through that process. So the insights that we gather by talking to consumers, the learning that we get through experimentation is, is just priceless to our organization. And um, I think at the end of the day, even though we're still measured by the, the um, what we're able to bring to market, there's, our organization uh, values that learning uh, much more so now. An example of a, a success, something you're particularly proud of? Well, I think, um, you know, th th that we've certainly uh, come a long way in terms of, of being able to uh, 
be uh, have be a better digital presence, particularly in our Medicare and retirement business. Uh, you know, for a long time there was a notion of, well, seniors aren't online, so we're, we're you know, that's not an area that we need to make a big investment in. And uh, folks are catching up quickly. So, uh, you know, boomers are 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 definitely online regularly now, and I think we've we've made some really fantastic progress in what we've been able to deliver in terms of tools and technologies to help people people manage their health digitally. So I would say that's probably one of our, our greatest successes in the last few years. And how big is your team and where do you sort of sit in the organization? Yeah, so our team is, is actually pretty small. We have about five people sitting in Medicare and retirement who are respo directly responsible for innovation. But then we have pockets of innovation teams also in different business segments throughout the company. So, um, and that can be a uh, uh, range from you know five to ten people here in this business segment or that business segment um, the way that we're organized though is we really come together under this umbrella of what we call innovation champions which is really a, uh, the connective tissue of innovators within United Healthcare and so um, even though we, we are sort of spread out in the different business segments we have this um, this connective tissue through our innovation champions that really brings together um, that collaboration at an enterprise level Great, thank you. Peter? Well, so academic institutions are a little bit different. We're <laughs> filled with people who have, are generating and getting paid to generate all kinds of new ideas. So we're, by nature, we're sort of innovative. But um, the problem that we have is that when somebody comes up with a new discovery, it's hard to tr get it translated into practice. It's, uh, you know, you can't, what we always say is you can't uh, build iPhones in a vacuum tube factory. So we've got to constantly be redesigning the care delivery system as the new ideas, the great new ideas are coming out. So the problem that we're wrestling with is uh, what, what, what if there were a way to create a vastly better way of impacting outcomes by harnessing all the motivation and expertise of all the people who work at Cincinnati Children's, but also all the patients and all the clinicians, not just the researchers. And what if the system allowed uh, the, all the participants, patients and clinicians and researchers to uh, use their collective creativity and expertise to act in ways that would improve um, health. Um, the model that we're uh, working on is more of an open science model. Uh, we're used to it in Wikipedia and TripAdvisor. Actually, the Human Genome Project is probably one of the best examples of how open science um, really accelerated the discovery of the, or the sequencing of the human genome. Um, you know, I'm going to give an example from my own work. Um, uh, Dominique Pahoud was kind enough to talk about it um, in a previous session. It's called the Collaborative Chronic Care Network Project, and our our goal in the project is to uh, uh, to harness all this energy around improving chronic illness care. The prototype that we're working on is inflammatory bowel disease. We have a network of 50 of uh, 52 care centers from across the country, um, a, a registry of 15,000 patients more than a thousand uh, uh, clinicians and their care teams uh, who are working together uh, to try and improve outcomes for kids with Crohn's disease and uh, ulcerative colitis. And what we've been able to see is uh, an improvement in the rate of remission for kids from about 50% up to about 77% this month. And that's in the, in the absence of uh, new, uh, new drugs uh, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, any uh, blockbuster therapy in the last uh, 10 years. The existing medications have been there. How did the doctors uh, do it? They did it by sharing. They've uh, shared data. They've shared stories. They've shared know-how. Um, and uh, they've standardized their practice. And through that, they've been able to learn much faster about what works for improving care for uh, kids with this disease. Um, and uh, they're seeing a, a considerable um, uh, improvement. It's an example of what the Institute, we like to think it's an example of what the Institute of Medicine calls a learning health system in which um, uh, data from the system feeds uh, knowledge production and uh, that knowledge is used through an ongoing improvement process to drive it back into the system. And how big is your group? So, well, the group in some ways is the entire uh, medical center. It's everybody who's uh, got a stake in this. But in the C3N project, there are currently uh, about 150 uh, uh, collaborators from around the world who are contributing. There's about uh, 10 uh, FTEs of paid staff. The rest are volunteers. Uh, and many are patients um, or uh, doctors who just have good ideas and are inventing stuff on their own. Great. 
So really innovation to drive collaboration, I think. It's, a, it's a, what we think of as a collaborative innovation model. Collaborative innovation, terrific. Wendy? So uh, I'm actually going to start with the back end of your question. That's fine. With how large my group is, because it has a lot to do with um, what we do and how we add value to the organization. Um, so we are a corporate function of innovation, and what that means is that we actually sit above all of our business units, and we report directly into the executive leadership team of the organization. But we are we are small and mighty. Um, there are five of us. Um, we extend the the capabilities of our team through um, what I thought when I came on board to the team was a pretty innovative approach of bringing fellows on board, uh, which is essentially a, a secondment position where people from across the company will come and join our team for a six or nine month period of time. Um, um, and it's a way for us to um, get a very inexpensive additional resource to our team, but probably more importantly, extend the diversity of our team because we're able to get people from across very different parts of the organization come onto our team and bring that different perspective of what happens across either manufacturing or research and development um, or a, a different part of our, of our um, a different therapeutic area across our organization. Um, and so what we're really focused on being being, being such a small team, but but having responsibility across the 85,000 employees within Pfizer and the you know it's a 60 billion dollar business um, is that we really see ourselves as the accelerators of innovation across our organization. There are a number of different areas within different parts of our organization that have other innovation teams. So our manufacturing group has an innovation team. Our consumer business has an innovation team. Um, and so we try to connect the dots in a lot of regard across what's happening uh, and developing platforms that would be relevant and help um, address the work that all of these different teams are doing. So one big focus of work for us is to help build a capability within our business to enable um, everyone across Pfizer to think more expansively and be more innovative in their approach to their everyday work and the problems that they see within their business. So we have a framework that we've developed um, um, and we, we try to share some of the best practices. We're in the process of developing more of a coaches network that helps to support and connect the individuals that are working across our business in helping to drive innovative thinking kind of at a grassroots level within the business. Um, we also provide value by being that extender. I think it was something that Paul had mentioned, being the extender to uh, external opportunities that are happening outside of our organization. So very often, you know, the bulk of our business, they're focused on their core business deliverables. What do they have to deliver for the next quarter? What do they have to deliver to make the numbers this year? So they don't really have an opportunity um, beyond what's directly relevant to their business to reach out in forums such as this or to reach out to to the startup community and understand what's happening more broadly that could have a bigger impact on our business. So our team does that and we try to make the connections either directly back to the business or try to identify ways that we could capitalize on some of the thinking that's happening in these incubators and accelerators. How can we bring that back and have a positive impact on our business? And then we try to leverage both of those areas, kind of building the internal capability, driving a culture that makes Pfizer more accepting of innovative innovation and innovative ideas along with the external connections to try to work on solutions that help advance our business. Um, so some of the things that have been incubated within the innovation team, we have a real world analytics team that's recently been established that helps us better capitalize on real world data and supplement a lot of the clinical trial data that we have on our products. Um, we've developed an integrated health business unit, which is a very different business model that tries to address more of the health uh, and wellness aspects of many of the disease states that, that, we have, um, that we have products in. Great. So we've been hearing a lot about sort of the structure and the processes that um, we have in place to drive innovation in our organization. But you may have heard the expression, culture eats strategy for lunch. And this applies to innovation. So if you want to have uh, innovation in an organization, it's not enough to be just focused on strategy in a large organization. You need to be building a culture that supports and embraces innovation. Uh, at Boston Children's Hospital, we do this by focusing on 
education, on community, providing resources, and really trying to create an environment where risk and failure are accepted because they're a big part of innovation. So I want to ask the panelists, and I'll take volunteers for the order this time, uh, what you're doing to enhance the innovation culture within your organization. So I'll, I'll start. So. Um, Innovation is one of our core cultural values, and as a result, we invest significantly in, in human capital around innovation and, and financial resources. Um, we also look to uh, bring innovation to all levels of our organization, and one of the seminal events that um, we, we have uh, been able to roll out is an, an annual Innovation Day at United Healthcare, and this we're in our third year running now, and Innovation Day takes place in the spring uh, at our corporate offices in Minneapolis. And through that event, we're able to bring employees from all over the organization to hear about innovative new concepts that are being developed. Uh, we expose them to different educational opportunities uh, where they learn about concepts like human-centered design and design thinking. We bring in thought leaders from, from across the company as well as from exter external uh, resources. Last Innovation Day, we had Guy Kawasaki come and talk to us about the art of the start. Uh, so, so that event has really, I think, resonated with our employees. And we've really seen them come and hear and be inspired and go back to their, their day jobs and, and start activities off the side of their desk that they're really passionate about because this just um, was such such a motivational event. And then another thing that we uh, have, have invested in is uh, rolling out innovation challenges, which we do at Innovation Day in conjunction with that event, but we also make those available throughout the year. Uh, we have an, an annual Hemsley challenge, so Steve Hemsley, our CEO, puts a challenge forth to all of our employees. Uh, that's a big meaty problem in our industry, and we have a, an electronic platform that our employees can use to ideate around that problem, and then the most promising ideas are selected for advancement. So those are just a few ways that we are trying to ingrain innovation into our culture at United Healthcare. Well, I like all of those ideas. I think we, we at Children's do some of the same things. We have an innovation day. I don't know, do you guys also have innovation? Yeah, this is becoming sort of, I think, part and parcel with how you uh, support innovation and you know, put challenges. We heard from Brian Civic this morning about what the government's doing to try to put out challenges to stimulate innovation. So I think we're starting to learn that there's certain tools that really work across organizations and not just in healthcare. But so other other comments on how you're driving innovation and innovation culture in your organization? I, I can say a few things. So it, we do, we, we don't do, we don't call it Innovation Day, but we do a, a very big conference every year, um, a two-day event where we put a lot of focus on what's happening outside of our organization and bring in a number of external speakers um, to educate people and, and uh, really get people excited about the potential and opportunities and really highlight. We also do, we have an awards program and it ties into our, to our annual conference. So every quarter uh, we recognize um, five key innovations or um, projects that represent innovative behaviors across the organization. Um, and it's recognized by the, the senior leadership team um, across the organization. And then at our conference, we actually do an Oscars um, where we take all of the winners from across the, the year and we, we recognize the, the um, projects that really are emblematic of what we're trying to deliver with innovation. And I think it really helps. I think there was some comment earlier about about the importance of recognition and making people feel as if they're being recognized for the efforts, whether whether it's ultimately successful from a business standpoint or represents a, um, a successful failure in terms of being able to learn from that experience. Um, so we do a lot of that. But the one thing we really struggle with, and I would have to say culture is probably one of the biggest barriers to driving innovation further within our organization. And we always talk about the, the kind of hypocrisy that on the clinical side of our business, the culture around innovation is so strong because it's so core um, to that organization being successful. So the idea of it being okay to fail and learning from that failure is so core to what we do in research and development, yet it's so not accepted from a, a commercial aspect within our business. And so we're trying to see how we can better capitalize and, and in a way learn from ourselves. How can we take some of the elements that help drive and support that culture? 
culture in that part of our organization and carry it over to, to the other parts. I think your academic medical center also has that same element, doesn't it, Peter, that there are people that are very innovative, but it doesn't translate always across the organization, and that's, we need folks like you to sort of catalyze uh, that. So talk a little bit about your innovation culture and, and how you get it to sort of permeate the whole organization. Again, we, Naomi and I do work in very, in, and you do, uh, the, the, I, the research side of your organization, also the, the rest, everybody else's organization uh, is this way. W one of the things that we're particularly interested in is the behavioral aspects of, of encouraging innovation to take place. And in an open source world where great ideas can come from anywhere, um, we want to encourage everyone to contribute and participate. Um, we call it, and there's a certain uh, leadership behavior that goes along with that, we call it being more like a galaxy and less like a star. So um, we want uh, decisions and communications less like a, a hub and spoke model and more like a dense network. One of the things that we're experimenting with is um, uh, actually the science of tracking this and um, some colleagues from the MIT Media Lab uh, and the Sloan School at MIT and uh, our team are working with using our email uh, uh, to track our own behavior and our communication patterns. We use it as sort of what we call a virtual mirror where we feed back to the, to the members of an innovation team what their, com their actual communication looks like, not what they say their communication looks like. And it's been very influential actually for the members of the team to learn about um, the, ways that they're communi the ways that they're communicating and we're observing some changes in their behavior um, just as a result of actually having the, their, the actual data feedback. Fabulous. Paul? Not too different than, than everybody else, I think, on the panel. We, you know, culture is, a, is an issue with innovation, especially if you're in a more of a traditional company. So one of the things I would say, culture trumps strategy, but leadership trumps culture. So <laughs> uh, we spend a lot of time, and I hate, to, I hate to beat this horse, but communicating. And it's communicating at the executive level of what innovation is and what it's not, so that you don't get in that situation where, you know, what have you done for me lately? and people don't understand that failure is okay or that you're trying a lot of things and you're piloting a lot of things. So we spend a lot of time communicating. We spend a lot of time doing quarterly newsletters. We spend a lot of time showing our roadmap to the people in the company. Um, we've instituted a crowdsourcing software so that the employees will all contribute their ideas into a crowdsourcing platform and those ideas get voted on. Uh, we tee up challenges, just like what was said here before. We have an award that we do every quarter. It's an innovation award. We have an innovation council, which is representatives from across the company sit on and vote. Um, and of course, if you're from Pittsburgh, you know, we're a big hockey town, so we actually have a very large trophy um, that gets passed around to the individuals who win the Innovation Challenge, and their name gets engraved just like the Stanley Cup. Um, so that's gone a long way to kind of introduce what innovation is and what it isn't and the level of expectation. Um, but culture change is, that's a long haul. Um, and I really believe that um, an innovation group has to be within the company. And so we're really concerned about not being seen as a skunk works group, um, that we're connected to the business, that the business knows what we're doing, because the only way you're going to change the culture is actually to be in the culture. And so we're very concerned about making sure everybody knows why we're doing what we're doing so we can get feedback on what we're doing. So all those innovation days and, and lunch and learns, and it's all about communication right now for us. So definitely some themes emerging. One that I, d I just want to uh, comment on is this idea of awards and recognition, which I think is so important because innovation is hard, it can be lonely, and if you really want to uh, build a culture, you need to recognize the people that are, that are innovating. And what I've learned over time is that those awards don't always have to be monetary, and in fact, they don't even have to be monetary at all. It's really the recognition um, to be uh, recognized as an innovator, to have a chance to talk about what you're doing. Our Innovation Day was sponsored by our CEO and president, and that was sort of a way for people to get uh, added recognition. I heard a great story from um, uh, the head of innovation at um, Brown Brothers in Boston. They wanted to sort of recognize uh, innovators, and so they gave out 
innovation mugs, and only if you were a successful innovator could you win a mug. And so even though these were like $4 mugs that they were giving out, they were highly coveted, and people really, they came to the meetings with their innovation mug and showed it off. And so it wasn't about the value of the award. It was really the recognition. And so I encourage those of you that are thinking about how to innovate in your organization to think creatively about how you can recognize the people that really are doing uh, the work. So I'll, I'm going to uh, throw out one more question. Uh, I think it's the hardest question I have for the panel. Um, it's one that comes up all the time and it's really about um, measuring innovation and measuring the outcome and measuring the value and some people even talk about the ROI. I don't love that. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about how you um, measure uh, the impact of the innovation or measure the impact of the program uh, that you run and, and show how it brings value in a large organization where leadership is very interested in whether they're getting value uh, from different parts of the organization? So again, any volunteers? OK, I'll, I'll jump in on this sure. one. Um, you know, for us, like I said before, we run a process. So my goals and objectives are very similar than any other goals and objectives in the company. And we have business process improvement, and then there's research and development, and then there's business innovation, and then there's ventures. And we all have different objectives. Um, but for my team, we measure our process. And so what I communicate out is our return on innovation, our ROI is, how many ideas do we have? How many ideas are going into business case? How many of those business cases are turning into pilots and prototypes? How many of those are actually being commercialized or actually operationalized by the business? So we have very specific metrics that we have to hit uh, to show uh, our leadership that, we're, that our process is actually working. Uh, and that can be anything that impacts revenue, uh, where we're generating revenue or we're saving money or we're improving the, con uh, the consumer experience and health or affecting the brand. And so all those metrics are applied to our process, uh, and, that's what I, and that's what I use. But ultimately, you know, coming on my third year here starting in January, you know, if we don't launch commercialized opportunities, you know, you're going to have a hard time explaining the, the impact of innovation. So we are very, very focused. And I think what keeps me up at night the most um, is, as an innovation guy in a traditional company, that that decision, I always say, well, you're one decision away from being a special projects group mm -hmm. to becoming a strategic impact to the company. Uh, and that's what keeps me up at night. Are we making the right decisions? Are we moving enough through our process and our pipeline to get to the other end and actually having an impact on the company? So that's what I tell my team, and we're all pretty uh, anxious, right? Um, but our process, we think, is working, and we'll be commercializing two opportunities uh, at the beginning of 2014, and we'll run those for a year. And if they fail, we'll shut them down. And if they work, we'll move them into the business. But that's ultimately the result of that process, and that's what we're being measured against. It's not net present value, so I don't want anybody to think that it's a you know, you got to have an NPV at the bottom and you're going to make, you know, but we do have business plans, but it's also a little bit higher risk than, you know, you know this business is going to work and you're going to run it for three to five years and here's the P&L. So it's a little bit of, a little bit of both. Yeah, process innovation is a way to think about innovation value makes a lot of sense and, and we, and I see a lot of heads nodding here. I think uh, everyone sort of recognizes that. Other comments or, or thoughts on, on good ways to, to measure and demonstrate the value of innovation? Oh, I'll chime in. Um, so we're, our mission, the mission of our group is really to, as I said before, accelerate innovation in our organization. And um, so we also have a number of metrics that are, that are a little bit more activity-based around ways in which we are um, pushing innovation or innovation thinking out across our organization. And so um, we do, we have a, a measure of the number of, of people across the organization that we've exposed to our innovation framework. Um, we're trying to keep track of, of the ideas that result from people being exposed to that framework to demonstrate the value of, of doing that. Um, we, uh, we talk about the number of ideas that we get coming in nominated for the awards that we do, um, the number of connections that we can make through our external exposure um, across the organization to demonstrate how we're bringing in more of these innovative ideas and trying to make a bigger difference in the, in the organization. Great. Yeah, we also track when we have uh, education events or forum events, how many people come, what the impact was. For us, since we're also trying to change the culture, we've done a lot of surveying, sort of almost a before and after, before there was an innovation program, and then now that there is an innovation program, do things feel different? So yeah, there's a lot of ways to sort of demonstrate the value, but it isn't always ROI or net present value. Anything else uh, to add? I, I 
the, a little bit more from a clinical angle, a, a big focus of ours is uh, on actual outcomes. So uh, we try and keep that in front of everybody all the time down to uh, data that we collect on a monthly basis on every clinical area that we're working with uh, down to how many uh, safety events took place or how many more kids we got into remission or how many, uh, how, how much reduction in um, uh, uh, adverse events might have taken place. And that's how we measure the effectiveness of our programs. Are we moving outcomes? Um, and then a second measure is what's our reach? And part of the reason why we're particularly interested in networks is that um, it, all of the diseases that we take, virtually all the serious diseases we take care of in, in pediatrics amount to rare diseases. Ch kids with chronic illnesses are uncommon, thankfully. Um, so we can only learn and, and improve by working together in networks. And we want to have a system that when we learn something, it's driven out into practice on a wide scale basis. We're fortunate at Cincinnati Children's have a lot of resources. M most of the pediatric uh, healthcare uh, providers don't have the kind of resources that we have, and there's a sense of generosity that we really need to be giving back to the community and making sure that uh, discoveries that come from anywhere um, reach children as soon as quickly as soon as they can. Great, Jennifer. Sure. So we've recently we obviously have our, our traditional metrics around innovation, but we've recently um, taken the tact that. Um, it's really, it's, it's a little bit more qualitative in that we're um, moving to more of this learning experimentation model where we're going through the rapid experimentation uh, as, as quickly and as often as we possibly can. So we're starting to put measures in place now where we're, we're as, as an inventor, we're really being uh, evaluated based on our ability to structure a high quality experiment. So being able to define a hypothesis and being able to capture what our assumptions are and then test uh, in rapid fashion against that hypothesis and assumptions so that we can really make sure that as we're bringing an innovation to life that it's going to be something meaningful at the end of the day and we're not just you know putting something out there that doesn't resonate with with members so that is a, a new way for us to to think about innovation but it, it's very much focused on the quality of, of thinking that we put into experimentation and design of, of a new concept Great. So um, let me see if there's some questions from the audience. I don't know, do we have some microphones? Raise your hand. I think we've got one over here. Um, so we talked, you talk a lot about innovation, and um, I guess the ultimate, the goal you all share is innovation that benefits the patient. And as you know, it, it's really hard to innovate alone. And could you talk a little bit about uh, your experience uh, working with others outside of your, your respective institutions? I'm happy to just comment on, on working with the patients. So um, a lot of our, our innovators are primarily doctors and nurses and folks who deliver care at Boston Children's. But we also have a patient and family advisory board. And we try to bring them in um, to help us when we're thinking about the solutions, particularly when we're thinking about operationalizing them and making sure that this also meets their needs. So they're a very important voice. But often, uh, for us, the inspiration initially comes from the care deliverer uh, themselves. We, um, in our world, we, we have member panels, we have provider panels, and we have employer panels. So we have a lot of avenues to use when we, when we have an idea or when we're working with somebody and we want to tee up something to get that research, the quick research back. So we have those avenues. I think from an innovation standpoint, we work with, you know, we're hooked into, we hope, a lot of networks around startup networks, venture funds. Um, and different local communities where the startups are coming through, incubators and accelerators. So we're exposing ourselves to that market. So we're working with as many startups as we can. Um, so as far as working with the community of innovators, um, we feel pretty strongly that we're at least heading in the right direction and getting their input to help us figure out where we need to go next. And, and we think we have a good uh, rapport with the startups that we're working with. Um, and we spend a lot of time with our investment guys who see different things than we might be seeing. So there's a lot of internal communication between the two. So if we have a good idea, we have the mechanisms to test it and, and get the feedback. And to get the idea, we have a lot of uh, front end relationships that we're working on. Great. Uh, other questions? There's one back there.
Uh, yes, based on your experience and lessons learned, if you were starting a new innovation function in another organization, what would be the top three things you would do in the first year? Great question. I can go because I just sure. did that two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think it's different depending on the organization, right? So what, what is the organization that you're moving into? What's the culture of that organization? The first thing that I would do, though, is what's the strategy? How are you going to map everything that you're doing against that corporate strategy, whatever that corporate strategy is? So that would be the first thing I would do. Second thing is establish a process so no one thinks that you're just winging it. Right? The last thing you want is people thinking that you're just around making up stuff, right? So strategy, mapping it to the corporate strategy, create the process, and hire really, really good talent. <laughs> uh, and you don't need a lot of talent. You just need the right talent. And I'll, I have a build on that, too. Um, I, I would, my advice would be to really be in tune with what the business needs are. Um, a lot of times as you're working in an innovation role, uh, you encounter resistance when you try to take a concept to scale. Uh, it becomes very difficult to operationalize. So soliciting business interest early is, I think, a really good idea because that way you can have a much clearer path to who would actually take an innovation and, and operationalize it. Uh, and there's an owner and, and a natural way of, of moving that into, into the business. Sometimes it's necessary to maybe hire a brand new owner if you're building a brand new business, but I think being very in tune to what the business needs are and keeping good relationships with business folks and, and soliciting their interest in your ideas early and often is key. Uh, I, I would add two things too. I would say, um, uh, one, just finding if there's a, a way to identify some quick wins so that you could demonstrate value to the organization. I think there's, depending on the organization, there can be some skepticism to what the value is or how you're driving value different from other activities happening within the organization. And then closely related to that is um, be very clear in communication around what your specific objectives are. Because I know um, in our organization, there are a number of people working on innovation-like type of projects, and so um, to be very clear where there are, what are your areas of focus, and scope that out so that you're not um, either duplicating efforts or people feel as if you're you're coming into their territory. Um, it'll it'll be easier to be more productive if you, if you're able to kind of negotiate that space for yourself. And I would just add on, uh, based tagging on to what Paul said earlier about uh, leadership uh, trumps culture, I would make sure that you have strong alignment uh, with senior leadership, that this is a priority, that they'll be supporting you. Because I think innovation is hard, and people are, as we've all been talking about, reluctant uh, to innovate or resistant to change. And so I think you need that uh, support also. Um, do we have time for maybe one more quick question? Um, I don't know if this will be quick, but uh, purely hypothetical, what would happen in your organizations, respectively, if uh, someone came up with something that would be cannibalizing to your own business? Ah, the old disruptive innovation. I, I think that what we try to do is convince leadership that this is the opportunity of the future, and if we don't take advantage of this new innovative way to, in our case, deliver care, somebody else will and somebody else will then, you know, become the leader in our area. So I, I think recognizing that, you know, if you don't innovate, you stagnate and you have the potential to die and that includes very disruptive uh, innovation. I, I personally think that we have to embrace it, um, but again, it can be a challenge sometimes w with leadership, but I think that's part of our responsibility as innovation leaders within our organizations. Yeah, I, would, I would echo that. I think we have to look at everything, and we're dealing with that right now. You can say telemedicine is a disruptor, if, you know, or you can say that um, retail clinics could have been a disruptor back, you know, when when they came out, or now Walgreens and Walmart. Everybody's getting into the health space, right? So you you have to, concierge medicine is a disruptor, right, in some form or fashion to the health business. So you have to look at every model, and you can't ignore every model. And that's the stuff I, I echo that that you have to look at everything. And if it's disruptive, great, because the the argument I use with 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 my team is who wants to be Kodak, <laughs> right? They had the digital camera before anybody else did, and didn't want to cannibalize their film business. At least that's the story that I'm yep. that I'm familiar with. And they didn't go to market with it, and look what happened. So I I think we're all 
wide open to new business models and new ways of approaching care, for sure. And I think that's also the value of being in, a, in an innovation function is that you get the opportunity to experiment. So it's not, you know, you can try out and get a better understanding of how certain things are going to work in the marketplace and how they may, maybe it's not a full cannibalization, maybe it can be an adjacency or maybe there's synergy to build off of your current business. And so to have the opportunity um, to experiment with that, I think, is, is part of the value of the types of roles that we're in where the traditional business wouldn't do that because they are solely focused on driving their current um, business goals. And so they're less open to looking at some of these more disruptive approaches, um, and they, they don't have the ability to do that. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. I think we could talk all afternoon uh, about innovation. I hope you'll join me in thanking our terrific panel, um, really a font of wisdom, experience, and if you have a chance to talk with them afterwards, I would encourage you to. So thank you all very much. Thank you.